Hello, welcome everyone. It is so nice to see you here. I'm Jessica Green, and together with Reverend Dr. Zina Jacques and Claire Nelson, we welcome you to our post-election edition of Courageous Conversations with Barrington's White House and Urban Consulate. We're live streaming from Barrington, Illinois. We really need to say an extra thank you for choosing to participate this evening. We know our national temperatures have been running high, which makes staying engaged with one another as fellow citizens ever more important. Thank you for building courageous community together. As Zena says, you are welcomed here and you are very much needed here. We thought this moment might call for some music. So we're thrilled to have two amazing singer songwriters with us tonight, including one of our favorite local talents, Pat McKillen, who will be joining us a bit later this evening. To open, we are so honored to welcome the incredible Lauren Elise, who has been hailed by NPR for her standout performance of her original song, Peaks and Valleys, that she'll be sharing with us tonight. Welcome, Lauren. The floor is yours. See? 
give a hand thank to Lauren. You. Thank you so much, Lauren, for joining us tonight and setting the stage for a wonderful evening of community at a moment in time where we really, really need to be together. Thank you. New friends joining us tonight. Over the last year, we've been gathering monthly to explore how to foster greater inclusion and build courageous community where everyone belongs. We've talked about everything from science of fear and bias to understanding privilege, to confronting prejudice, challenging separation, cultivating curiosity, and most recently, standing in another's shoes. Months ago, when we closed our eyes and imagined whose wisdom we might need after this particular election, we thought of one of our favorite thought leaders on American democracy and civic life. Eric Liu of Citizen University and Aspen Institute. Election season, he is in high demand, as you can imagine, so we are so lucky to have him here tonight. Thank you, Eric. In his past life, Eric worked in the White House as a domestic policy advisor and speechwriter, but his post-political life has been as a civic evangelist, writing and speaking and holding Civic Saturday gatherings across the country to explore our duty and privilege as citizens to build a stronger democracy. His TED Talks have been viewed millions of times and his books are valuable texts for our era, including You're More Powerful Than You Think, A Citizen's Guide to Making Change Happen and Become America, Civic Sermons on Love, Responsibility and Democracy. He co-created the Better Arguments Project to practice better conversations across divides. And you might have heard him on NPR or CBS Sunday Morning offering great advice for challenging times. How this will flow tonight, for those of you who are new, we are again so happy to have you here. After a conversation between Eric and Reverend Zena, we'll enjoy a song, take a short five minute intermission to stretch and refill our refreshments, then have a full hour of breakout dialogue and share outs guided by our fantastic facilitator core of volunteer fellows and advisors. We'll share the questions before the break so you won't be surprised and you can chew on them a little before we start. Just stay on the line and you'll be automatically moved into a breakout room by our tech producer, JP. At the very end, before 9 p.m., we will all come back together to share out, which is really the best part, to see the stream of everyone's responses and conclude with a closing word from Zena. So please stay with us until the end. We are recording this presentation, so please remain muted you're welcome to turn off your camera to listen, but we really love to see your faces, especially in breakout dialogue. We will publish the video afterwards on our website, and we are thrilled to be working with 365barrington.com, who is publishing takeaways from each session too. Thank you, Liz Luby. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce my co-host and beloved pastor of the Community Church of Barrington, Reverend Dr. Zina Jacques. Good evening, everyone. We are so grateful that you have made time this evening to join us. And Eric, uh, um, how prescient we were when we made this invitation to you. I cannot imagine a better dialogue partner for our souls and our minds. Um, we, we entitled this Becoming America because we recognize the process is not over. The ING nature of that word reminds us we are in process. And I'm also reminded, Eric, of words that you shared on a TED Talk when you were in Christ Church, New Zealand, uh, and you encouraged those people to see themselves as being present at the beginning, present at the beginning of something brand new. We, tonight, as we gather, are 
at, at are present at the beginning of a new America. And as you travel and talk about all of the things that are going on around us, the racial reckoning, the political polarization, the pandemic, all of the, the things that are, are pressing in on us, as we stand at this precipice, this becoming, this at the beginning, I'm really curious, how are you feeling right now? Well, Reverend Zena, first of all, it's just a joy to be um, in dialogue with you. Um, it's really an honor to be part of this whole series. Um, Jess, thank you for that introduction. Uh, Claire Nelson, who's uh, um, really more responsible than anybody else for me being connected to uh, this gathering. I'm really grateful to you, Claire. Um, and just uh, the entire endeavor uh, that this community uh, gathers this way, um, virtually and eventually again, um, Barrington's White House uh, is an inspiration. Uh, it's kind of awesome to be part of this. And, uh, um, you know, I, I will say, Reverend Zena, that, um, you know, the, the, the thing, the, the TED Talk that you quoted that I'd given um, out in Christchurch, New Zealand, some of you may know, Christchurch um, was uh, the locale of a devastating earthquake, I think back in 2014, um, that leveled most of that pretty significant large community. Uh, and, uh, and this TEDx event uh, that uh, I got a chance to go to uh, was part of this bottom-up civic awakening um, of people recognizing that rebuilding after a disaster is not just about the built infrastructure. It's not just about government coming in to say, um, we're going to fix this bridge or repair these gas lines or what have you. It was about the people of that community taking responsibility uh, for the recreation. Uh, and so to be present at the creation um, is, I suppose, the silver lining of being in the wake of a disaster. And, uh, you know, we gather here today to your question, um, not in the wake, but right in the teeth of a disaster, uh, a couple of unfolding, ongoing disasters in our country. Uh, the fact that COVID is surging anew um, to levels not yet seen in our country, um, uh, as circumstances get more and more um, hospitable for the spread of the virus. That's a very scary thing to be in the midst of. Um, at the same time that our economy has cratered and at the same time that our democracy is under so much strain. And so we are in the midst of these slow motion live action disasters. And the question for us, I think, is can we summon some of that same spirit of recreation, of committing to each other to pull together and uh, start repairing our institutions, repairing our relationships, repairing our bonds of trust and affection that are the prerequisite for any kind of uh, uh, healthy civic life. And, um, uh, you know, I feel, in spite of everything I just uh, uh, listed, I actually feel net hopeful. Uh, and that's because I spend a lot of my days with groups like you all. Um, and uh, and I grant right off the bat, that's, you know, that's a little bit of confirmation bias. I'm, I'm looking for what I see and I see for what, I, what I'm looking for. Uh, but I see enough of it in enough places, uh, in enough quarters, uh, that I really do believe that uh, even in, and perhaps precisely because of these times, um, there is a great civic awakening underway. Uh, people like all of you who've been showing up first in the White House and then um, now together in, in this way online. And we are all yearning for the same thing, which is community, meaning, and purpose. And so to get to be part of this tonight uh, uh, is uh, an honor, as I say, but it's also, it's part of the work we all got to do um, to be present at the, at the recreation. Um, I love the word hope. It, theologically, it means confident expectation. So when you say hopeful, it, it can mean that there's a confident expectation in what we are able and will do. So that, that lifts my spirit. Uh, Eric, I, I, to just, I just gotta say something to that because you're so, you embody uh, th that sense of hope. Uh, and I think it's also super important to distinguish between optimism and hope. Yes. Right? Um, optimism is just, things are gonna work out great, right? Which in a way is, uh, you know, an attitude that lets you off the hook. Uh, because it says, I don't have anything to do with it. I think things are just going to work out great, right? But hope, as you say, uh, implies and requires our participation and our agency. Um, and 
Uh, and so, you know, to be net hopeful is also to be real about the fact that there's plenty of stuff on the other side of the ledger <laughs> to be angry about, to be scared about, to be hopeless about, uh, but to summon that spirit that you just articulated and embody um, is what it means for us to, 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 to believe and hope. And, and your phrase net hopeful requires us to hold both sides of the ledger. So, uh, well, I, I, wanna, I wanna offer you some of your own words. I want to read to you your own words and then ask some questions uh, uh -oh. about your words. Recently on NPR, you said this, what's amazing and exciting and should be empowering to so many of us right now is that we are attempting something for the first time in human history. And that is to make Earth's first mass multiracial democratic republic. Let me say that again. Earth's first mass multiracial democratic republic. You continued by saying, no other country has tried to nail all four of these marks. Other societies have done one or two or three, but to be, a ma to be at mass scale, truly multiracial, to have a culture of democracy and have representative government in a republic to make all of that work at once would be a freaking miracle, <laughs> a miracle. When I hear this, it makes me wanna ask you three things. Do we need to um, reimagine our social contract? And, and what does that mean to you? And second, what, what makes the way for healing in a nation so divided politically, racially, economically? What are the steps for that healing? And third, what are our challenges? What are our opportunities? So do we need to reimagine our social contract? What makes the way for healing in the midst of division? And what are the challenges and opportunities? Mm. Well, you know, I think the, the, what I described uh, as a freaking miracle, um, it, you know, I described in those terms just to rekindle in us a sense of both, uh, well, a sense of awe, uh, number one, uh, and number two, a sense of responsibility. Uh, th there is the cliche, um, you know, anybody who's a fan of the Spider-Man franchise, uh, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Uh, but what we often forget is that the inverse is also true, that with great responsibility comes great power. Mm -hmm. The more we take responsibility for each other, for our community, for the health of our society, the more power we activate, generate, and create. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the, the potential miracle of being able to deliver on a mass multiracial democratic republic uh, does require a reimagining of the social contract uh, in a sense. Um, you know, I think it depends on how you define the current social contract. The current social contract is clearly broken. We, we live in a society that for four plus decades um, has been allowing and in different ways accelerating and abetting the concentration of wealth, voice, income, and power into fewer and fewer hands. Um, and so that gets expressed sometimes in terms of inequality or the 99% versus the 1%, uh, but it's in every single fractal domain of our lives. Uh, and when you get that kind of hoarding and clumping and concentration of wealth and power, you get everywhere this unspoken, imperceptible, uh, contagious sense of scarcity. Uh, everybody's freaked out about losing what they've got. Uh, and. Uh, and everybody looks around at the person next to them and think, hey, why are you getting a little bit more? I'm going to tear you down or I'm going to feel very threatened by that. Uh, instead of asking, uh, why are a few uh, having, getting so much more disproportionately than the many? We live in a time where, you know, 1980, 1%, the top 1% of Americans accounted for about 8% of national income. Today, that same 1% accounts for between 20 and 22%, right? Imagine if 1% of your body contained roughly a fifth or a quarter of your blood supply. Imagine if my pinky was loaded with a quarter of my blood supply, right? My pinky would think for a while, man, life is good. Times are flush, right? This is awesome. But after a while it would realize 
that actually it's not so great because the hand that it's attached to can't muster the strength to raise itself from the ground. And that the body that the hand is attached to is on the ground because there's not enough blood to circulate to sustain the entire body. And then as organs shut down and the body begins to collapse, belatedly that pinky realizes, oh shoot, I am of the body. <laughs> I am connected to the whole. And so to reimagine a social contract is not to say just, all right, time to attack the super rich, time to tear down the 1%. No, it is to make a case for the circulation of the lifeblood of the body politic. And the case is not merely charity or altruism. It's certainly not a case of resentment by the have-nots against the haves. The case is a case of self-interest properly understood because true self-interest is mutual interest. The pinky does better when the hand and the body it's attached to is alive. Just a simple fact, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it does even better if that body is healthy. And so we've got to create not just a social contract, but a new narrative, a new way for imagining what it means to contribute to the common good. That it's not a matter of, oh, okay, I'll sacrifice and pay a little bit higher taxes, or okay, I'll accept that because I'm a charitable sort. No, this is for your own good. Okay, I'll tolerate the raising of the minimum wage, uh, even though I don't think these grocery baggers or home care aides should be making more than 850 or whatever. Look, the thing is, there is a charitable, compassionate case to be made for a living wage, but there's also a great business case, which is summed up this way. When workers have more money, businesses have more customers. <laughs> and you create a virtuous cycle of increasing demand and increasing prosperity. Uh, and that by analogy is true of every effort we can and should make in a new social contract to ensure that power, voice, opportunity, and prosperity are truly circulating throughout the body. Your second question, Reverend Zina, about healing, I think flows very directly from that because um, we are not an ahistorical body, right? We, we didn't just get born yesterday. Uh, parts of the body politic have been clamped down upon, have been kept out of the opportunity to move uh, for generations, for centuries. Um, and so the reckoning that we as a society are in the midst of right now that um, I think you know, went to another level after the murder of George Floyd um, and has sustained through um, many other such uh, tragedies and through the pandemic, uh, this awakening and this reckoning, this realization among um, many people and many institutions that had just wanted to keep this thing over there at bay. Why are those agitators making so much noise? Why are folks complaining? If you didn't want to get shot by the police, maybe you shouldn't have filled in the blank, right? Uh, and just wanted to buy into that kind of narrative. We live in a time right now where those narratives don't hold water anymore and where people are recognizing that uh, justice, again, is not charity. Justice <laughs> uh, is our mutual interest. And so for us to begin a process of healing, whether it's around our racial divides or around these deep, uh, profound political and ideological divides that were just reinforced uh, by the presidential election, uh, what we've got to be able and willing to do in the first instance is rehumanize mm. our civic life. Right now at every scale, we operate in this way where we don't see each other. What we see are avatars or proxies for storylines that we've heard about on TV or on social media. So I don't see this human because this human's wearing a MAGA hat, or I don't see this human because this human is black and is wearing a hoodie. I just see a story in my head that I got from somewhere else. And I don't even know where I got it from. And I don't know why it's activating this feeling in my heart of fear or contempt or whatever it might be. But what we have to relearn is a habit of actually seeing each other. And that's why things like courageous conversations are so vital for, to our country right now. The ability to build that muscle again of actually seeing people in their full complexity and contradiction, right? <laughs> people aren't 100% woke or 100% ignorant, right? People are complex amalgams of better angels and inner demons. Mm -hmm. And the more we can acknowledge that about ourselves, the more we might be willing to admit that that might be the case in this other person who we actually are, lear are learning to see. And I think that's the greatest challenge we have right now. 
Um, there, there are structural challenges for sure. Uh, and as this new administration uh, gets ready to think about its policy agenda, there'll be lots of conversation about structural reform, Medicare for all, changing the tax system, immigration policy, all that good stuff. And look, I used to work in that world. I used to work in structural reform. I'm, I'm all for that. And I'm all for smart people spending time on that. But our work at Citizen University uh, as a nonprofit and as kind of a catalyst for a movement uh, is premised on the belief that culture precedes structure. Mm -hmm. Culture is upstream of structure, that the norms, narratives, values, and habits that we buy into and propagate as a matter of our culture, that's what forms the frame of the possible when it comes to structure and structural debates. And so our challenge right now is to create a different kind of culture. And indeed, that's the mission statement of Citizen University, to, to foster a culture of powerful, responsible citizenship in which we are recognizing that citizenship, not understood as papers and passports and documentation, but as an ethical matter, requires both literacy and power and cultivation of character. If you only have half that equation, you're in trouble. Because if all you are is super literate in power and you know how to get what you want and move people and ideas and money, but you have no moral core, you're just a sociopath. But if all you have is a really finely elaborated philosophy of how to be, but no earthly idea how to get stuff done or move people and ideas, then you're just philosophizing, right? It is the fusion of power and character that we've got to cultivate right now. And that is a bottom-up cultural phenomenon that this series is an embodiment of, that the Civic Saturdays that we've catalyzed around the country, these gatherings that are a civic analog to faith gatherings, they're part of it. Living room conversations are a part of it. On being is a part of it. There's just a hundred of these flowers blooming all across the land right now. And that is going to be, I think, uh, the challenge for us is how do we accelerate and spread um, uh, these promising signs of a renewal and a revival? Um, and can we do it in time uh, before all those other forces that I'm talking about uh, lead to a uh, complete fracture and collapse uh, not only of the social contract, but of the, of the society itself. Eric, you've asked us in many ways to write a new narrative. Um, but I see around me this base emotion of fear. And, and I'm not even sure people know what they're fearful of. How do we combat fear because we don't have the space to work on the narrative as long as we're building walls. So, so what do we do now that we have built up this store of fear and on top of that is anger and on top of that, but, the, but I think the base emotion is fear. I think you're so right. And you know, in your life as a faith leader, um, in my life as a civic evangelist, um, we're using slightly different tools to come at the same thing, uh, which is to create a space of permission for people to name and face their fears and to do so not in isolation and, uh, and loneliness, but to do so in the company and fellowship of others. And so I think the first thing we've got to do is just to make it possible as a matter of cultural and civic ritual for us to be in a room like this and say, what are we scared of? and to not be scared of the answers and to not be ready to pound somebody if the thing they say they're scared of is you, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, and just to say, look, I'm going to let this be voiced. I'd rather it be voiced than not voiced. Uh, and we, we do a thing, so we, we have a program at Citizen University uh, called the Civic Seminary, where we're training people from around the United States, from tiny rural towns to big cities, um, all, all across the geography of the, of the states. Uh, to lead Civic Saturday gatherings of their own. And these Civic Saturday gatherings are, are truly a civic analog to a faith gathering. So it's not church or synagogue or mosque, but it has the flow and the arc and the feel uh, of such a faith gathering. And you'll, you know, you walk in the room and you'll sit down next to a stranger and you'll talk about a, a common question that cuts right through small talk, like, what are you afraid of? Who have you failed recently? Um, we will hear texts uh, whether it's poetry or things that you might think of as civic scripture drawn from throughout the American tradition. We will sing together because Americans don't get to sing together enough. And that just feels good to literally inspire and ex, you know, exhale together and, and make voice together. Uh, there's a civic sermon 
that someone will deliver to make sense of this moral moment. And, and then there's civic circles, uh, not unlike the breakouts that uh, folks will form into here today to think about, okay, how do I convert this inspiration to commitment and action where I am and where I live right now? And as we've been training people in the civic seminary program to lead these gatherings uh, around the country, um, we've come upon a very simple format during, during the four day training. Um, we have this thing where we do, we have two side-by-side -side maps of the United States. On top of one, it says fears. On top of the other, it says hopes. And then we give everybody a pile of post-it notes, right? And now that we're doing that, we're doing it on Zoom now. So it's all, you know, using Google Maps and stuff, but same principle, right? A pile of post-its, hopes, fears, and you give them, you know, five, seven minutes, just write as many hopes and fears as you can, fill up the map, the two maps, right? And then everybody looks and sees this collection of post-it notes on both of the maps. And we collectively, we read them aloud um, and we sit with them. And it won't surprise you that the things that people are scared of are more numerous uh, than the things that they're hopeful about, uh, more detailed, more particular, uh, more vivid. Uh, and that itself, the naming of that is both cathartic and a little bit sobering. But then we do a thing that they weren't prepared for. We then go up to those two maps and we switch the two headers. And we ask them for a moment, consider that there are people where you live, in your community, in your family maybe, um, who regard everything that you are fearful of as something that they are hopeful for and vice versa. Right, you're you're fearful um, that white supremacy is going to be sustained yet another generation. And there are other there are other folks who are like, you know what? I'd be down with that because <laughs> I'm fearful uh, that I'm about to be replaced by all these people of color and all these immigrants who are coming in. Um, you're fearful, uh, you know, on and on and on. Right? You can imagine the ways in which these things get switched. And I think that exercise itself is part of the kind of spiritual yoga that we have to do, the kind of psychic, like being more limber uh, and not getting rigid and just falling in love with our fear set uh, or our hope set. Uh, and imagining if we loosen it up a little bit that uh, there are others who would flip those two and that there, there are parts of our own heart that might flip those two. Uh, and so I think it's practices and exercises like this that again, are not done in isolation, you clicking at your, you know, at buttons on a screen uh, and getting an email feedback in return. No, this is in conversation. This is in fellowship. This is in the awkwardness of having someone else hear what you just said. Um, and that's how we, I think, uh, begin to contend uh, with this fear. But the last thing I'll just say though about fear and because, you know, implicit in everything we're talking about and, and we've named it a couple of times, Reverend Zena, is um, the centrality of race. Uh, to any notion of Americanness. And th the big thing that we're going through right now on a tectonic level is that two things that used to be interchangeable and intertwined are now decoupling and detaching from one another. And those two things are whiteness and Americanness, right? For most of our country's history, they were just synonyms, you know? You ask somebody to picture an American and poop, someone, you know, a face like Mitt Romney's face pops into your imagination, right? A clean cut white dude. Uh, and, uh, and we live in a time right now where those things are delinking and that creates both incredible excitement, incredible anxiety, incredible hope, incredible expectation, incredible impatience, incredible urgency and fear. And let's name all of it. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, our ability to, in a mass multiracial democratic republic, be grownups about this um, is crucial, that we don't just feel fear, smoosh it down, and then basically have completely um, distorted ways of acting out uh, because we never name those things in our own hearts. When you've worked with people in civic seminary, because what I hear you talking about is breaking open, breaking open. What changes when people are willing to be broken open? <sighs> Boy, what a beautiful question. I, I hope what changes in the first place is just that people let go of certitude. One of the greatest ills of our time is a both a culture and a set of incentives that just reward and reinforce righteous certitude. Yes. Left, right, you know, rich, poor, whatever, everywhere. There's just a, we're swimming in righteous certitude. Learned Hand, who was a federal judge in the 1950s, a great jurist who 
uh, one of the best who never actually made it to the US Supreme Court, uh, gave a speech in I think 47 or something shortly after World War II about the spirit of liberty. And there's a line from that that I always quote, which is the, sp the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure it is right. Yes. Right, and I think that we could use a giant dose of that right now. And the breaking open that you're talking about, um, I think enables the release of certitude and the re-embrace of some humility, intellectual and emotional humility. I might not be right. <laughs> what, a, what a concept, I might not be right. Uh, Claire and I came to know each other first, Claire Nelson um, from Urban Consulate because um, we partnered on, on a project that, uh, you, that, that Jess referred to earlier, the Better Arguments Project, which is a collaboration of uh, a program I run at the Aspen Institute, uh, plus a wonderful nonprofit called Facing History and Ourselves, um, uh, with the uh, deep partnership of the Allstate Corporation. So those of you in Chicagoland, you know, just a great, uh, a, a great national citizen uh, based in, in the second city there. And I think uh, what we've tried to do with the Better Arguments Project is to remind folks that it's okay to argue. America is an argument, <laughs> right? We're nothing but a set of arguments. We don't have a common bloodline. We don't have a common religion. We don't have a common history on a common piece of territory. We're just bound together by a bunch of ideas and ideals that we are meant to perpetually argue over. That's okay. But we should try to have less stupid arguments. And uh, <laughs> And less stupid arguments begin in the first place with what we're talking about here, not only a release of certitude, but you know, one of the principles of a better argument that we've elucidated in this project is take winning off the table. You would be amazed at what will happen uh, when you're engaged with somebody you're disagreeing with if you take winning off the table. Mm -hmm. Just make that a private mental emotional commitment. I'm not here to own you, to destroy you, to humiliate you in this argument or debate. I'm just here to understand. If you replace winning with understanding, I want to understand, how do you see the world? How did you come to see the world this way? What formed you? What deformed you? Like what, 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 what shaped you in this way, right? And I'm asking these questions not to play gotcha, not to lay a trap so that I can then pound you and own you and <laughs> destroy you, uh, but really just to understand you. And when you enter into an argument that way, um, the other person can feel it and you create a space of permission again for them perhaps to reciprocate. Now, will they guarantee reciprocate? No, maybe they won't. Maybe they'll think, oh, this person's a sucker. I will now own them and pound them. That's their loss, right? You're just there to understand. And I think um, that mindset and heart set, I wish to understand. I'm not too sure I'm right. I do have core beliefs, but I want to understand the complexity of you and the world we're in together. Um, that I think is what is possible when we start breaking things open. And, um, and what you do um, through this program and others that I know, Reverend Zena, that you do, and what we try to do at Citizen University is to, once you do that initial cracking open and that release, is to create conduits uh, into which that new energy can flow. Um, and the conduits can and should take the form of ritual, right? We've gathered here today and Jess didn't run this thing like it was a city council meeting. She didn't say, okay, welcome, it's 801. Uh, on the agenda today are the following items. Uh, you know, please queue up uh, for comment time after, like it was not that drone of a death march of a meeting, right? It was a ritual. We had song, we had joy. We had a moment of just kind of centering ourselves. Uh, you opened with a mo moment of reflection uh, that connected us beyond this moment in this time to another time and another place in Christ church and other ideas and other ways. And we ritualized this, right? And I think that's, that's why we do Civic Saturdays. That's why uh, you're doing Courageous Conversations um, is that people want to find meaning and make meaning. And if you create those conduits in a way that has just that little touch of a sense of intention um, and collective purpose, uh, people will keep coming back just the way they're coming back for this. Oh, Eric, wow. There's so many ways we could go, but, but there's a question that, um, that, that is a struggle for me. Uh, I, I am an American, never lived anywhere else. And I experience, and I think many of us experience this great cognitive dissonance 
between these American ideals and our American reality. I read in our founding documents, all men are created equal, endowed with an inalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. I, I read, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Liberty, equality, justice, tranquility, a more perfect union. How do we narrow the space between these ideals and the evening news and Fox News and MSNBC, our reality? What are our steps? What would you tell us to, to consider? Well, I would say, I would name that gap in the first place or the closing of that gap. And then I would describe some things we can do. There's a word for the closing of the gap between our stated creed and our actual deeds. The closing of the gap between our high American ideals and our actual broken, unequal, unjust institutions. And the closing of that gap is called true patriotism. True patriotism is not rah, rah, we're number one. I'm gonna be louder than you about America. True patriotism is saying there is something exceptional but exceptionally burdensome about that creed. It, it works a great burden upon us because we are now called to live up to it. And you know, my parents were, I'm a child of immigrants. My, my, my parents were born in mainland China uh, during a time of revolution and war, they went to Taiwan uh, and then ultimately came to the United States. And uh, I will tell you, there is no Chinese idea. There's no Chinese creed. There are no set of promises that the citizens of the People's Republic of China look up to and they hold their police force or their national government to account and say, you are failing to establish justice. You are failing to provide for the common welfare. You are failing to live up to equal protection of the laws. They don't have that. They're just hunkering down and in good times like China's enjoying now, they're enjoying the, 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 the prosperity. And in bad times, they just had to eat it, right? In, in Chinese, the phrase is chi ku, eat bitterness. It's one of the greatest Chinese traits there is to be, to be able to eat bitterness. But in the United States, we have the blessing and the burden of this creed. And true patriotism is working every day to close that gap. It is not just saying, awesome creed we have, our creed's better than any place else. No, it's saying, here's how I'm gonna be useful. Here's how I'm gonna show up. Here's how I'm going to take some measure of action to close that gap. And that gets to the heart of your question. What can we do? Show up, join a club, pick an issue, learn about that issue, commit to closing that gap. That issue can be homelessness uh, in Chicagoland. That, that issue can be uh, the, the failure of investment in public transportation. That issue can be the fact that you live in this uh, part of Cook County in a food desert, uh, or you live in this part of the South Side uh, in, in an area where there, there are no good uh, uh, higher edu education opportunities, whatever it might be, um, that you see where you live an opportunity to engage on an issue and then join a club. I, I, I don't use those words lightly. Uh, we Americans have forgotten how to join a club because joining a club requires you to pick a thing of passion, find others who share that passion, try to come up with common goals requiring a common agenda, requiring a common habit of compromise, sacrifice, forbearance, mixing up of agendas, prioritizing together, and recognizing that it's a game of infinite repeat play. And if I don't get my way today, maybe I'll get my way later, right? That set of muscles and practices and habits is foundational to being able to govern ourselves. Uh, and so um, if you wanna close that gap, don't just watch MSNBC, don't just watch Fox News, don't just rant at the TV, don't just scroll endlessly and doom scroll. Um, that's all spectatordom. That's all watching stuff happen, right? Uh, we've got to actually do stuff and make stuff happen. Um, and in so doing, we will become each other's teachers in power.
uh, power is a, uh, you know, a big part of our work at Citizen University is about teaching power and, and helping people recognize that power is not a thing out there worked upon me. It is inherent in all of us and we should stop giving it away the way that we are mindlessly, continuously giving it away. And power is a language as well. And to become literate in power means to understand where it arises, who has it, who does not, what sources it comes from, money, people, ideas, social norms, and how we can mobilize all those things, money, people, ideas, social norms, to change the frame of the possible, right? That's a very theoretical abstract thing, but it becomes incredibly concrete if you and a bunch of neighbors decide that you wanna form a club uh, to ensure that uh, policing practice has changed uh, in your part of town, or that you form a club to a gardening club because you live in a blighted area, or whatever, 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 right? You form a club that wants to be welcoming to refugees uh, because our country is not welcoming enough to refugees right now. Whatever it might be, uh, that is the thing that we can do to start closing that gap between our high ideals, that exceptional burden, uh, and, uh, and our actual institutions. Oh my word. Um, I, I have heard you talk about the, um, the overdeveloped sense of rights we have in our nation and the atrophied sense of responsibility that we have. And you, I hear you inviting us to build that responsibility muscle back to equal or maybe supersede the strength of that rights muscle. And I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, we are headed toward the eight o'clock hour when we have promised our colleagues that we will break into groups. So I, I, do, I do have um, a final question. Um, I wanna ask you the same question we're going to ask everyone else here tonight in our breakout dialogues. And you, you have answered it in part, but I, I just wanna, I want you to help us get ready to ask this question to our friends. What do we need to do to rebuild our civic trust? And, and how are you doing that? What are you willing to give? What are you willing to do personally? Eric? I think one of the best ways we can rebuild trust is to be trustworthy. Hmm. Make commitments to some people. Make some promises to some people. Hey, I, I hear your, your mom's having a hard time with her health. Let me bring by some dinner next week. And then bring by some dinner next week. <laughs> and be understood as a neighbor that, who can be counted on, be understood as someone who will be there when the chips are down. I think we build trust by, as we were talking about earlier, Reverend Zena, um, by cracking open a little bit of that vulnerability and saying, I may not be right. I really want to understand you. I'm not here to play gotcha. I'm not here to, to try to beat you and score points against you. Like, please tell me what shaped you informed your worldview that I honestly so disagree with. And I will do the same, right? And we can build trust. And the, the outcome of that will not be, okay, we agree to split the difference and we will now you know, change our worldviews. No, you will still have your different worldviews probably, uh, but uh, you will have rehumanized each other. And what am I willing to do in this regard? I mean, what am I willing to give? I think this is actually the great question for all of us right now, because, um, I mean, I'll answer it first. I mean, I'm willing to give my time. I'm willing to give my taxes, my money. I'm willing to give my platform. Uh, we're elevating all these people we're training for uh, in our Civic Seminary program to lead Civic Saturdays. Um, we want Civic Saturday to be a phenomenon understood by hundreds and hundreds of people leading them, not by uh, as a thing that Eric Liu does. Um, and so, to circulate and distribute that power and that voice. Uh, I'm willing to challenge people who think like me. In my case, it's people who are on the left and to say, why are you so sure you're so sure? Uh, and are there dangers to that certitude? Uh, and not just on the obvious things like cancel culture and so forth, but just the, uh, you know, the, the, the more subtle performative ways in which 
uh, uh, progressive virtue signaling ends up get, kind of getting in the way of dealing with each other as humans. Uh, and so I'm willing to take a little heat from my own side <laughs> uh, in that regard. But I would invite everyone who's here to think about that. What are you willing to give? Um, my friend Yuval Levin, who is conservative, who's on the other side of the philosophical spectrum from me at the American Enterprise Institute, he had a wonderful piece in the New York Times recently an op-ed that I would encourage you all to look up, talking about how, you know, after the election, it's still going to be, uh, to your point, Reverend Zina, on us to take responsibility. We have to create a culture of responsibility bottom up. And he formulated that in a simple question that everybody should ask themselves. Given my role here, what should I be doing? I'm a parent. What should I be doing with other parents? I'm a teacher. What should I be doing uh, with my students and other educators? I'm an elderly neighbor. What should I be doing with the kids uh, on my block? Uh, I'm a manager. What should I be doing with the people who work for me? Uh, whatever your role is, I'm a faith leader. I'm a student, whatever, right? And that is a reminder that we all have power in different forms and we all have responsibility in different forms. And, uh, and I think that the more we embed that question in our hearts as a matter of habit, uh, the more I think, uh, look, it took us 40, 50 years to get to this level of brokenness in the United States. Um, and uh, the repair and the reinvention uh, of our democracy and our civic culture um, is not going to happen overnight. But it's going to begin with um, conversations like ours and conversations like the ones that are just about to begin here uh, in breakouts. And uh, I just want to, again, close by saying how grateful I am to you, Reverend Zena, um, for guiding us in such a heart-centered way and uh, to this whole this whole shebang for being such a great uh, uh, literal physical embodiment uh, of everything we're talking about at the spirit level. Um, it, it's pretty awesome to be part of and, uh, uh, and I'm grateful to have been with you today. Um, I still have eight minutes and like any Baptist minister, I'll use every minute I've been given. Um, Eric, on the days that you are um, disappointed and, and, and down and your energy you've spent. What's the encouragement that lifts you back up? Would, would you share with us words of encouragement um, as, as, as now truly your final words to us in this moment? Absolutely. I think one of the best, I'm a student of history. I was a history major. I am, uh, and I'm perpetually concerned and a little stunned at how short how little memory we have as Americans. Uh, and I think the best thing we can do to give ourselves some encouragement uh, is to recognize that, yeah, this is hard what we're going through, um, but imagine what it was like to be a black office holder in Illinois in 1877, right? So reconstruction has been going for a decade, but just now, in a corrupt bargain of a presidential election where electors switched in the Electoral College, uh, the North and the South agreed, yeah, we're done with Reconstruction. A decade, we're calling it good. Um, and all of a sudden now, you're realizing that uh, the wind that had been at your back for a short little moment um, is now blowing hard in your face. Uh, and doors are closing in your face and worse. And institutions are starting to put up signs. and. And that's in the North, that's in Barrington, Illinois, right? And imagine your counterparts in the South. And to recognize people who had gotten their hopes up after the Civil War, after emancipation, during a decade of reconstruction, only then to have a dark, heavy curtain fall for the next half century, for the next 60 years, for the next 70, 80 years in the United States, during which Jim Crow took hold in the South through lynch mobs and took hold through the North through redlining, mm -hmm. right? Imagine living through that. Imagine not just a moment, not just an election cycle, but your whole adult lifetime yeah. being ground down like that. And then imagine the persistence of people like W.E.B. Du Bois, yes. the folks who founded the NAACP. Imagine the persistence of the generation that begat the generation that begat Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. Right? Because Rosa Parks didn't just decide one day she was tired and sit down on the bus. She was trained at the Highlander Folk School, 
which was formed by people who a generation before had been pushing and slogging through hopeless times. And they were formed a generation before by people who had no good reason to believe that democracy could ever deliver for them. And still they kept showing up, right? We're not going through anything compared to that. To establish justice is a hundred times easier today than it was a hundred years ago. And so, you know, to me, maybe that sounds to your ear like suck it up. I don't mean it, <laughs> suck it up. I mean, let us draw hope and inspiration from the fact that people no better equipped than we were managed to do much more with much less. And we've got an opportunity right now, in fact, uh, to deliver upon the preamble of our constitution uh, and make that society a reality. So let's, let's get to it. I cannot thank you enough. If hope is indeed confident expectation, you have filled us with hope. My brothers and sisters who are on this call, would you join me in thanking Eric in whatever way seems right to you? Uh, we are blessed by your presence and your wisdom, and we are grateful that the generations that formed you did so in exactly the way they did, that you might form the generations to come. Blessings be upon you. Jess, my sister, back in your hands. Thank wow. You. Thank you so much, Zena and Eric. My note card pile is up to here, and I can't wait to go over this again. There's so much wisdom that you have both shared with us tonight. Thank you so much. Before we welcome Pat McKillen for a song and a short break, we wanted to share the questions we're going to be discussing together in our breakouts. So you can start pondering. This is our chance for dialogue, not debate. So we're going to be listening to understand, as Eric mentioned earlier, and we're going to use the six grounding virtues we hold from our friends at On Being Civil Conversations and Social Healing Project. And I'll just run through what those are again. Generous listening, humility, patience, hospitality, adventurous civility, being mindful of our words because our words matter. So here's a preview of the breakout question. In today's social and political climate, how do you feel like you are most misunderstood? Whose wisdom about society and civic life do you carry with you? What received wisdom do you hold? And how has that served you? When you stop for a moment to think about it, what did that wisdom leave out? Anything you were taught that you would like to lay down or replace? And what do you need to rebuild civic trust? What do you want to give to rebuild civic trust? Your facilitators will have those questions again at the breakout time, so you don't have to worry about writing them down. It's also on the screen. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce Pat McKillen to perform his song, Halfway Home. Welcome, Pat. The floor is yours. Hey, y'all. I am coming to you live from my bedroom here in downtown Chicago. Uh, thank you so much to Courageous Conversations for having me. Uh, Eric, big fan, Zena, even bigger fan. Sorry, no offense. <laughs> um, I wanna share, I wanna share a song tonight uh, that I wrote called Halfway Home. Uh, not because not just because we're about to take a little break here, but this song's about being stuck in place. And uh, I don't think it's in our nature to be stuck in place for too long, um, whether that be physically or emotionally, it's just that we get comfortable. Um, so I think this group and this song is a reminder to get up and move around once in a while and make sure you're seeing things from another perspective. Because in your growth, you're only halfway there, you're only halfway home at any given moment. So. Someone's always changing their mind It feels like I I change mine every night Someone's always falling behind And it feels like I Am at the back of the line So break your silence And cut your teeth on the road 
And chase them headlights Oh, find your honey, find your gold Someone's always choosing a side But it feels like I I'm still towing the line Someone's always gonna be right But it feels like I, I've been wrong every time So break your silence And cut your teeth on the road Chase them headlights, oh, find your honey, find your gold. Mm -hmm. So, what do you want to be? What do you want to know? And what do you want to see? Where do you want to go? And what do you want to be? And what do you want to know? Cause we're only halfway home. Someone's always changing their mind. Feels like I, I change mine every night. Big hand for Pat. Thank you so much. That was gorgeous. Thank you. We'll be back in five minutes, everybody. Grab a drink, come back, take a stretch. We'll see you soon. <laughs>